Greetings and welcome. We are in Junior English, and we now turn to the great American poet, many argue maybe the greatest American poet of the 1920s, Edwin Arlington Robinson. I'm with you on page 640, 641 really quickly in your hymnals. I want to start uh, by pointing out, and we're going to look at two of, of Robinson's poems, Luke Havergal and uh, Richard Corey. Both are uh, poems that tell a story, but from different perspectives for sure. We are on page 640 under literary analysis, and you want to write this down at 2B. Narrative poetry, narrating, telling a story, poetry that narrates or tells a story, focusing on three different elements, plot, setting, and characters. As we go into these two poems and we start to study them, we want to maybe ask ourselves a little bit about each of those. All right? Two things about Robinson we want to point out that are significant. One, the first thing we want to point out is that by the time he dies, he is considered maybe the most successful, we won't call him maybe the greatest, but certainly the most successful American poet. Number two, why is that significant? Because he starts out in poverty. He does not have wealth. And because of that and his struggles with wealth, he is going to make observations at times about living without money, living without stuff. We'll get to that one maybe in more detail with Richard Corey. I want to turn now to page 643, 642, 643, and the Luke Havergal uh, poem. It's always difficult for your anthology makers to know what poems will serve as representative of these great poets. The two here for us are two different kinds of poems in some ways, but similar in other ways. Let's go ahead and say it out loud. Luke Havergal is a poem about lost love. Let's write that down at level one. Lost love. Okay. Now, without saying anything else, I just want us to read this poem. Notice it is a poem of four stanzas. Did you see that, right? A poem of four stanzas. So we want to pay attention now to the story that is narrated in this poem. We'll listen to professional reader. Just follow along. It's all you got to do. Here we go. Luke Havergal by Edwin Arlington Robinson. Go to the western gate, Luke Havergal. There where the vines cling crimson on the wall, and in the twilight wait for what will come. The leaves will whisper there of her, and some like flying words will strike you as they fall. But go, and if you listen, she will call. Go to the western gate, Luke Havergal, Luke Havergal. No, there is not a dawn in eastern skies to rip the fiery night that's in your eyes. But there, where western glooms are gathering, the dark will end with the dark, if anything. God slays himself with every leaf that flies, and hell is more than half of paradise. No, there is not a dawn in eastern skies. In eastern skies. Out of a grave I come to tell you this. Out of a grave I come to quench the kiss that flames upon your forehead with the glow that blinds you to the way that you must go. Yes. There is yet one way to where she is, bitter, but one that faith may never miss. Out of a grave I come to tell you this, to tell you this. There is the western gate, Luke Havergal. There are the crimson leaves upon the wall. Go, for the winds are tearing them away. Nor think to riddle the dead words, they say nor any more to feel them as they fall. But go, and if you trust her, she will call. There is the western gate, Luke Havergal. Luke Havergal. Now one of the things that made this poem so popular in its day is the sound of the poem. Let's jump to 2B before we even work at 1 or 2A. Notice the sounds of this poem. Did you notice the rhyme scheme? Havagal, line one, ends. Wall, line two, ends. 
Then you have the two words come and sum at lines three, four, which rhyme together. Then you have again, notice the sound of Habagal in fall, call, and of course then repeated Habagal, Habagal. Notice in the second stanza, it plays the same game again. Do you see it? Skies, I hope you're looking at this with me. We're looking at something quite creative and it's genius. Notice, skies, eyes, and then lines three, four, gathering, and then anything. Notice the I-N-G sound. And then we're back again with flies, paradise, skies, skies. Then notice the third stanza. We play the same game with this, kiss, is, miss, this, this, and then glow, go, right? And then you play the same game back with the A-L sound again, and notice it's going to be a way and say. So you have some very intentional rhyme scheme happening here, which is going to kind of make a certain feeling of this poem that is what it's supposed to be, a little bit kind of freaky. At 3A, some of you will point out, this sounds a lot like something Poe might, might, read, might write, right? That kind of Edgar Allan Poe type of poem that is in longing, right? If you know Poe's poem, Annabelle Lee, it is also a poem about a dead girl. Let's go ahead now and work at level one. What is this poem actually about? Well, you have a guy, Luke Havergal, who is obviously very interested in a girl who is now dead. Can he meet her? Can he talk with her? Is there a place he can go where maybe she will call for him? Notice the opening lines Go to the western gate, Luke Havagal, there where the vines clean crimson on the wall, and in the twilight wait for what will come. The leaves will whisper there of her, and some like flying words will strike you as they fall. In other words, maybe you can get some information about her. Of course, we already mentioned Poe at 3A. We could mention, of course, his Raven, Lenore, same gig being played here by Robinson, right? Okay, he's missing his girl. Let's talk about it at 2A really quickly and a couple of possible messages. One obvious message here is uh, the question of depressive states related to loss. When going through a grieving process for someone that you love, it is only natural to ask, where is that person? And can I speak to that person maybe again? So notice you've got that game being played here, right? He wants desperately to know at the very end of the poem, but go, and if you trust, she will call. Maybe you can get some information, some message from her, right? Another possible message, of course, is that death is the great unknown, isn't it? We don't know what happens after we lose someone. So it begs the question, is there any chance for some kind of communication with the dead? To be, we've already mentioned, amazing intentionality and rhyme scheme going on here. The use of sound to create effect, we might say. Let's talk at 3A really quickly. Of course, here we can ask about your favorite film, in regards to a person who has to come to terms with death, the death of someone here she loves, right? Jot down what is for you that poem of all poems? What is for you that movie of all movies, that TV show where there's this intense, intense longing for someone who is gone? Do you have a movie where somebody from the other side who has died actually corresponds or talks with somebody on this side, the living? Okay, maybe through the form of what's called a seance or some kind of contacting from the other side, right? Many, many years ago, there was a famous Patrick Swayze movie called Ghost where this very thing happened, right? And you had a person who dies who's totally in love with this girl and he wants to talk with her from the other side, okay? Let's point out that this is a very old motif. One of the most ancient moments in classical literature is when Aeneas, the great Roman hero Aeneas, goes into the underworld and has conversations with his girl Dido, D-I-D-O. This story is told in the great Roman epic, The Aeneid, A-E-N-E-I-D, The Aeneid. And there, Aeneas has left his girl jolted, he's, he's left her, he's bolted from her, it's called the Jilted Lover, and 
Dido kills herself in sadness about the fact that Aeneas has left her. Later in the poem, he goes into the underworld, and there he sees this girl. She's really beautiful. And he's like, wow, she's really beautiful. Wait a minute. That's my girl. That's Dido, the girl who killed herself because she was mad at me and sad. I left. And he wants to try and have a conversation with her. It's a famous moment in, in uh, mythology and, of course, in literature where you try and have that conversation after one of the two is dead and gone. Final 3B question. What are your thoughts about afterlife? Do you think that people who you really love can still connect with you after they're gone? A student of mine once saying, no, no, every morning I hear my great grandma's voice who I love dearly, and she would tell me to have a really good day. And one of the students laughed about that one. Dude, that's kind of freaky. And she goes, no, no, it's not freaky at all. I can hear her voice every morning, and I know that she is somewhere telling me, you'll be a good girl today, be a good girl today. I can hear her voice, and it makes me want to be a better person because I loved her so much, and I want to see her someday. What are your thoughts about afterlife? Do you believe that when you die, you get to go see people who you loved? Do you believe people who you love who die can actually talk with you or correspond with you? What are your thoughts and feelings about that? Some students say that stuff just totally freaks me out. I have absolutely no interest in that. Other students will say, I kind of like that idea that maybe if I'm really in love with somebody, that somebody can correspond or talk with me, communicate with me in some way. Hmm. In the end, where do you come down on this question of what happens to you after you die? Do you believe that there is such a thing as afterlife? Do you believe that there is such a thing as someone will be able to correspond or you can correspond? Of course, what's one of the most famous examples of this and maybe a story that you know? Charles Dickens classic, I'm back to 3A for a moment, The Christmas Carol, remember how it opens, right? Scrooge is met by the ghost of Marley who comes back to talk with him and then of course Scrooge himself gets to have the visit with the ghost of Christmas past, doesn't he, right? Mm, very famous. Let's turn to the second of the Edward uh, Arlington Robinson poems, Richard Corey. Now I should point out, this is a different, totally different kind of poem. It shows the range of Robinson, and this becomes maybe the most anthologized of all of Robinson's poems. Richard Corey was able to as well make a message, send a message that maybe we'll ask about at level 2A. All right, here we go. Let's just read the poem now with our professional reader, Richard Corey. Follow along. Richard Corey by Edwin Arlington Robinson. Page 644. Whenever Richard Corey went downtown, we people on the pavement looked at him. He was a gentleman from soul to crown, clean favored and imperially slim. And he was always quietly arrayed, and he was always human when he talked. But still he fluttered pulses when he said, good morning, and he glittered when he walked. And he was rich, yes, richer than a king, and admirably schooled in every grace. In fine, we thought that he was everything to make us wish that we were in his place. So on we worked and waited for the light and went without the meat and cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet through his head. Now, let's just start it. Let's just start really quickly. This is a poem that has some shock value, doesn't it? I mean, notice this is a poem that when you read it, you go, whoa, 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 what did we just read the final line was? This is a poem about some cat that blows his brains out? Are you serious with me here? Wait a minute, though. Let's point out something. You are totally set up, unless you're a really astute reader, you are totally set up for this final line, aren't you? Because the poem is about a guy named Richard Corey, who is in four stanzas, right up until the very last line, the guy that everybody looks at and goes, that's the one right there. That's the successful guy. That's the one you want to be like. And then all of a sudden there's the final line. Two, two things we want to point out really quickly at level one about this poem that makes it somewhat fascinating. 
We could say at level one, it is a poem about a guy that kills himself. That's true. But this poem is way more interested in the we. Did you see it in the second line? Now again, hey, hey, hey. I'm trying to teach you how to read closer. Notice in the second line. We'll read it from the first line. Whenever Richard Corey went downtown, we people on the pavement looked at him. We people on the pavement. Who is the we in this poem? Last stanza. So on we worked and waited for the light and went without the meat and cursed the bread. Can you jot down really quickly at level one, who is the we in this poem? Obviously people who really respect Richard Corey, yes, no doubt. Look up to him, yes, no doubt. Like the fact that Richard Corey is rich, he's good looking, he has all of the things that you would want in life that make you a success. But who is the we in this poem? That is going to be significant in how you read this poem. Yes, it is a poem about a guy that blows his brains out. But the real focus of the poem is not Richard Corey. The real focus of the poem is the we. All of the people who admire him. Now, definitely we have class distinction going on here, don't we? Notice that the we are people who have to work. They, they don't get to eat meat. In other words, what? They're poor, right? So this is, of course, going to be the poor looking at the rich and assuming things about the rich. Wow, look at him. Therefore, the shock, and we might say it, the irony of the final line. Notice how Robinson totally sets you up. Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet through his head. And you kind of go, whoa, whoa, what did I just read? I thought this was like the guy everybody wanted to be like. He was. Or was he? Raising the same question at 3A that Lawrence Dunbar will raise about wearing a mask. Notice Richard Corey has a mask. Let's now talk really quickly at level 2A here, messages, themes. One obvious message is things are not always what they appear. I would definitely write that one down in 2A. Things are not always what they appear, right? Sometimes things are different. We have their appearances and then there's this other side. Richard Corey, notice we're told, wow, all the things about him. He's a gentleman. He's clean favored. He's very thin. He's always dressed well. Always a nice guy when he talks. He was able to make people's pulse kind of beat faster when he would say good morning to them. He was rich. He went to the right school in the third stanza. In short, we thought he had last two lines of the third stanza. Did you read it? We thought he had everything to make us wish that we were in his place. He has it all. Richard Court. And then, yeah, maybe not so much. Notice what is not in this poem. What's missing in this poem is the reason that he takes his life. Why does Richard Corey go home one calm summer evening and put a bullet through his head? No answer to that. You can obviously speculate as to why that would be the case. But notice Robinson doesn't give us any indication of this. Why? Because in the end, the poem is not about Richard Corey at all. Let's make another observation at 2A, another message here, and that is often people want what they don't have without realizing it, how it would change them. Stories abound of people, for example, who don't have much money, who win the lottery, and it destroys their life. Lots of stories about this. You can Google this. It's quite fascinating. The number of people who have won large amounts of money who committed suicide. What? Dude, if somebody right now gave me $15 million, there ain't no way that that would screw up my life. Are you so sure about that? Dude, people with $15 million, they get to live a life I do not have. Right, like what? They get to go to the best schools. They get to look good. They get to have everything they want because they're rich. Surely those people are not unhappy. And notice what Robinson says. You don't know everything. You don't know everything. And in fact, just because somebody looks happy doesn't necessarily mean that at all. Right? 
Of course, there is this desire to try and be someone that you're not. That's another message here, obviously. Be careful. Don't try and be somebody else. Don't try and be somebody that you're not. Don't envy somebody just because you think they are a certain way. Because guess what? That somebody may not be that way at all. At all. Of course, there is a tragic, tragic message in this poem, isn't there? That in the end, no matter what you have, it doesn't always mean that you're a happy person. Possessions don't always make people happy. We might even say it most of the time, possessions don't make people happy. you got to have some basic needs. But notice the distinction in the final stanza. Notice, so on we worked and waited for the light and went without the meat and cursed the bread. In other words, they're not happy with the life they live as poor people. They assume everything they want is contained in the life of Richard Corey. Not so much. He goes home and he puts a bullet through his head. For reasons, again, we do not understand at all. But one thing I guess we can point out, those, those riches and all that stuff he had didn't make him happy enough to continue to live his life. Of course, at 2B, let's point this out really quickly. This is a narrative poem that is a shocking ending. If you were planning this as a plot for a story, right, you would have the story where you see him and he's like this amazing guy, he's got all this stuff, and then at the very last line of the story, you would say, he went home and put a bullet in his head. You'd go, whoa, 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 right? It's kind of a shock ending for a poem, okay? Some students have pointed out this is a very different kind of poem than a lot of the poems that I've read before. This is just a poem that just tells kind of a brief bit of information, but it's making a clear point on a number of levels as we talked about at 2A. All right, let's work at level 3 really quickly. At 3A, what is for you the text that immediately comes to mind about at the end of the, 